All right, I'd like for you to turn in your Bibles to the book of Ecclesiastes this evening. And if you were to ask me, what is my favorite book in the Bible, I would answer, whatever it is I'm supposed to be preaching this week. That's usually how it works out. Uh, if you caught me at an odd moment where I had no uh, particular assignment, I think I would gravitate to Ecclesiastes probably more than any other book. It is a book I return to often. It is a book I use much in my own life to counsel my own heart. It is a book I find readily available in my mind to answer life's tough questions. I would commend it to you. I expect that what will happen this evening is something of a fire hose approach to the book of Ecclesiastes, enough to tease you into reading it a little bit for the rest of your life. And if you wait for Robert E. Murray McShane or your reading plan to bring Ecclesiastes around your life once a year, I would suggest it's not enough. Let me also say at the front end that Ecclesiastes was written as a singular message. That is, it was written as something of a sermon with a beginning and an ending, and it is best read all in one shot. And there are details to study. There are places to slow down. But it is very easy to get lost, discouraged, despairing, confused, vexed if you don't get all the way to the end. And the end is where the answer is. So let me start our time by jumping into the first verse here of Ecclesiastes. This is in a section of your Bible called Wisdom Literature, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, the words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem, vanity of vanities, says the preacher, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. Some of your translations say meaningless, meaningless, everything is meaningless. There's something very wrong with the world in which we live. A traffic light turned red, forcing me to stop when there was no cross traffic to trigger it. There were also many green traffic lights that made for an easy commute, while others had to wait. I got to go straight through. Grape leaf skeletonizers, they're little black and yellow caterpillars, that are evil, have stripped all the leaves on my grapevines of my red seedless grapes so that there are no leaves to protect the plant and therefore no grape clusters this year. We had homemade ice cream with fresh peaches after lunch this afternoon. A young man proposed marriage this week to a young lady and she said yes. A dear friend lost her mother today other dear friends welcomed a new baby into their home this week. The sun rose this morning. 10,000 new babies have been born in the United States as of this hour just today. Five kiddos in my house smiled at me as I said good morning this morning. This year alone, nearly 22,310,000 human babies worldwide have already been killed intentionally in the womb. Brave men collapsed on beaches in France so that we could have backyard barbecues day after tomorrow and live free from tyranny, often oblivious to the price paid for that freedom. My wife, my under the sun treasure, told me that she loved me. My cars are rusting, my body is falling apart, treasured possessions are lost, relationships are broken, and yet we have taste buds for the enjoyment of good food, ears and eyes to take in aesthetic delights of sight and sound, and a palette of emotions for the experience of friendship and love. There are so many good things in this life, so many unspeakable tragedies as well. In the century in which I was born, way back in the 1900s, evil men rose to power. They made enemies of humanity and they slaughtered men, women, and children on an unprecedented scale. Technological advances allowed Adolf Hitler, Joseph Stalin, Idi Amin, and Pol Pot to carry out genocidal machinations. 
And yet that century also brought about remarkable improvements in health and well-being, eradicating diseases and making life easier. Louis Armstrong could sing, I almost tried to do it, I'm not going to do it, What a Wonderful World. And Paul McCartney sang, Eleanor Rigby died in the church and was buried along with her name and nobody came. Often there doesn't seem to be a connection between the way someone lives and the things that happen to them. Listen to the words of Ecclesiastes 8.14. There is a futility which is done on the earth that there are righteous men to whom it happens according to the deeds of the wicked. On the other hand, there are evil men to whom it happens according to the deeds of the righteous. This is futility. How does one make sense of the mixed messages of our existence? Of joy and pain, life and death, happiness and misery? Is there meaning to it all? A sea of humanity tries in vain to find some answer, some lasting purpose to earthly existence, but the answer is elusive, seemingly just beyond the next corner. Maybe behind the next scientific discovery or the next technological advancement, the next medical breakthrough or the next philosophical construction, there will appear the key to life. So far, every human effort to construct a consistent universal worldview has been hoisted on the petard of its own limitations, dashed upon the rocks of our own incompetence. Surely, if somebody had found out by now what is the key to life, they would have told us, and everyone would have agreed and jumped on the bandwagon. Yet there are nearly as many answers to the question of the meaning of life as there are people who have walked the earth. It is as if the very enterprise of finding meaning has been cursed. It is as if the whole world is cursed. And this evening, we're going to take a thrall, a stroll, I don't know what a thrall is. We're going to take a stroll through this book of the Bible called Ecclesiastes to find answers to the riddle of life. And we will learn from a man who ruled the world and who had the world at his disposal. A man who seemed to be ruled by an obsession to find the meaning of life. If you've wondered why there is evil in the world, if you have wondered why there is not a straight line correspondence between behaviors and outcomes in this life, if you have been vexed and frustrated or despairing or even felt that the universe was meaningless altogether, you're in good company. This book asks and answers the questions that plague humanity. Spoiler alert, We get the answer from the ending of the book of Ecclesiastes, and I'm going to give you the answer up front. It's something like telling the answer to the riddle before you ask the question, like telling the punchline to a joke before you tell the joke. Are you ready for it? If anything, it made him more sluggish. I took the shell off of my racing snail, thinking it would make him faster. you get it? If anything, it made him more sluggish. So you tell the punchline before the joke and, and it just kind of falls flat. But I would suggest to you that telling you the ending of the sermon of Ecclesiastes before you begin the sermon is actually quite helpful. You need to know the end from the beginning. So skip to the end. Turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 12. And this is really helpful for this book of the Bible. It it sort of gives us the hermeneutical key to the whole book. And, And this riddle of life is worth spoiling up front. There's no need to wander aimlessly through a cursed existence when the answer is available at the start to anyone who will listen. Ecclesiastes 12, verse 13, the conclusion when All has been heard is, right, there's our clue. This is the key to life. This is it. Fear God 
and keep his commandments. For this applies to every person. For God will bring every act to judgment, everything which is hidden, whether it is good or evil. What's the bottom line? Fear the Lord. That's Old Testament shorthand for you must be in a right relationship with your maker. If you're to make sense out of life, You need to know the author of life. If you're to make sense out of your existence, you need to be in a right relationship with the sustainer of your existence. If life is a great grand tapestry, a tapestry that we see from the bottom, if you've ever looked at a good oriental rug and you looked at it from the top and you see the intricate designs that are clearly made by a designer and then you flip over the rug, what do you see on the bottom? Lots of random threads, colors going everywhere, and it makes no sense whatsoever. We live under the sun or beneath the tapestry of the great big scheme of life that God himself is weaving. He knows what the picture is. That's not our privilege. And if you're going to survive in this world, if you're going to thrive as a creature, if you're going to make sense out of life, you must know the maker of the tapestry. And you must trust him. That's what Solomon means when he says, when the conclusion needs to be heard, the end of all of this message is one thing. Fear the Lord. Obey him. This applies to every person. You need to be in a right relationship to God. Ecclesiastes covers the topics of the Bible from the beginning to the end, from creation to final judgment and eschatology. It's going to help us get a grip on life. We need this book. Let me give you some suggestions for how to approach the book of Ecclesiastes. Uh, one way that people have approached this book is sort of a hit-and-run scheme. They, they find their favorite quotes, uh, they run away from the main point, and they just pick up what they want. It's like um, w- when I was uh, in high school and I took a task at the church, I, I decided to volunteer for the youth pastor and say, hey, give me some tasks around the church, I, I want to be helpful. And he said, great, um, There's some weeds out in the yard. You could could pull those. And I took my lunch break and uh, had my Bible. I thought I'm gonna be really spiritual and I had Ecclesiastes 2 open and I came to verse 17. It said, so I hated life for the work which had been done under the sun was grievous to me because everything is futility and striving after the wind. It seemed to make a lot of sense on my lunch break when I pulled weed after weed after weed and I realized I was not going to make a dent if I pulled weeds all day. It was all futility and it was under the sun and I was sweating and I hated life and I thought a really good spiritual answer would be to go to my youth pastor for whom I volunteered and quote a Bible verse. He'd read a lot more of the Bible than I had. (laughs) He was more familiar with Ecclesiastes than I was. And he told me that judgment was coming and I needed to fear God. (laughs) But that's an approach that some take. Hey, I I think I can find something I like that's going to suit my attitude right now in the book of Ecclesiastes. And guess what? If you've got a bad attitude, you can find a verse to support it in Ecclesiastes. Why? Because Solomon is driving at something. Spoiler alert, what's he driving at? Fear God. In fact, he wants you to despair of every other option, everything under the sun. He wants you to come to the conclusion that every other pursuit is futility. So he's going to take us down the path of all those other pursuits. And of course we will be vexed, and so of course you will find language for your vexation. You got a bad attitude, you can find a verse to support it in Ecclesiastes. <laughs> That's not the right approach. Another approach is to insert your own philosophy into this book. This is the philosopher's dream book in the Bible. And I've said this before, I'm not a huge fan of philosophy. Um, philosophy on its face should be the love of wisdom. Sophos, wisdom, philo, love for, a love for wisdom. That's what it should be. Where does wisdom begin and end? The fear of the Lord. But the world's set of philosophies tries to figure out life apart from God. Let's see if I can figure out a way to have a consistent worldview without regarding my maker. 
And of course, every brand of philosophy comes after every other brand of philosophy and says, all the other ones before me were bad, I have the answer. Then the next guy comes and says, no, I have a better answer than him. And it's this endless train. But every single one of those philosophies can find something to agree with in Ecclesiastes. And so if you're more of a philosophical bent, I like thinking deep thoughts. You're going to find some deep, vexatious, confusing thoughts that you can hold over other people's heads and go, ah, there's philosophy in here. But again, if you do not tie it to the end, to the purpose for which this sermon exists, you will miss the point. And you will misconstrue God's words. People do this all the time, whether it's Epicureanism, that is the idea that the meaning of life is to be found in pleasure now. Well, listen, there's verses in Ecclesiastes that talk about finding pleasure now. Or nihilism, that the meaning of life is actually nothing. Fatalism says it doesn't matter what you believe or what you do because everything stinks. We're all going to die. Cynicism, I'm convinced in my negativity that there are no answers to be found. My philosophy is we just throw our hands up and say there is no answer. There's a whole host of pessimistic approaches In fact, I have collected a a large library of commentaries on the book of Ecclesiastes. Most of them are pessimistic. I believe most of them miss the point. Most of them uh, also deny that Solomon wrote it, and some even deny that God himself wrote it. And so, of course, they miss the point. Taken in isolation, stolen from the author's intent, there are verses in Ecclesiastes that could support all of those philosophical bents. There's another approach to Ecclesiastes, and it is to take it as God's word. 2 Timothy 3.16, Ecclesiastes is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. I believe that. I've seen it in my own life. 2 Peter 1, 20 and 21. Ecclesiastes was not a matter of one's own interpretation. It was not made by an act of human will, but Solomon, moved by the Holy Spirit, spoke from God. I believe that. God wrote this book. God wanted us to hear and understand this book. And there are statements in this book that God intended for us to grapple with. Statements like, there is a time for war and a time for peace. Or, the fate of the sons of men and the fate of beasts is the same. As one dies, so dies the other. Indeed, they have all the same breath. There's no advantage to man over beast, for all is vanity. Or this one, so I congratulated the dead who are already dead, more than the living who are still living. Better off than both of them is the one who has never seen the evil activity done under the sun. All of these statements are enigmatic dark, mysterious, out of context. It benefits us to work through them and understand the place of these words in our Bibles. Every word placed by God on purpose for us deserves our close attention. So what is the message of the book of Ecclesiastes? Again, skip to the end. You must be rightly related to your maker. I would sum it up this way, you cannot enjoy life until you choose to enjoy God. There are a lot of things to enjoy in life. In fact, the book of Ecclesiastes will detail for us things like a really great relationship, family relationships, architecture, agriculture, music, food, drink, marital relations, work. All of these things in the book of Ecclesiastes, are gifts from God, and yet the joy in them is not actually found in them as an ultimate. In other words, if you have set your heart on squeezing out of your occupation all that could be squeezed so that you get ultimate satisfaction from your identity in what you do, you'll be disappointed because your job cannot give to you that kind of joy. That's ultimate joy. And that can only come when you fear the Lord and obey Him. When you're rightly related to your maker, then the maker of all things 
who's the one who designed you and work and enjoyment, actually gives enjoyment as a gift. It is God's grace. Now you might be thinking, well, who likes work anyway? Work stinks. I like recreation. Same thing applies. What is the message of Ecclesiastes related to recreation? It's a gift of God. Some will find that they are given every recreation under the sun and it leaves them empty. Why? Because ultimate joy isn't found in the gift. It's found in the giver of all gifts. And until you get yourself right with your maker, God may give you everything you thought you ever wanted, but withhold the enjoyment of it. And that is the tragedy of our world. With all its conveniences, with all its opportunities, with expendable income and lots of time, people spin their wheels trying to find enjoyment and satisfaction and ultimate things in temporary, limited, under-the-sun things. And it will always prove vexatious. It will always be disappointing. In fact, another way to say this theme of Ecclesiastes, you cannot enjoy life until you choose to enjoy God. Maybe to say it this way, only Christians can have fun. Only Christians have access to it in any real and meaningful sense. The world has its definitions of fun and it has its means by which it tries to get it. But again, it is always fleeting. In fact, one of the fundamental words in the book of Ecclesiastes is this word vanity. In the New American Standard, it's translated vanity in chapter 1, and other places in the book, it's translated futility. It's the same word. It's the Hebrew word hevel, and its significance is in its nothingness. It is a weighty, significant, big, fat word that means everything simply because it means nothing. It's like the early morning mist in the hills of East Tennessee by about 10 o'clock. It evaporates and dissipates with the sun as if it had never been there. You try to get a hold of it, it's nothing. Solomon says it's like grasping after the wind. Life is described with this word, hevel. A, a vanity, an emptiness, a nothingness. In fact, it's the same word used in the Old Testament for idols. They are actually nothings. There is an illusion that there is a something, but they are great big fat nothings. One of the biggest words in the English language is floxy nasi nihila pilification. It means the estimation of something as valueless. Used a lot of letters to say nothing. That's the idea of the word Havel in Ecclesiastes. A great, big, significant, weighty word to describe the evaporating nothingness of trying to get satisfaction out of life apart from God. Listen to Ecclesiastes 5.19. For every man to whom God has given riches and wealth... He also empowers him to eat from them and to receive his reward and to rejoice in his labor. This is the gift of God. Notice the things that are given there, riches and wealth, but also the ability to enjoy them must be seen as a gift. That means we must be dependent on him for the enjoyment of the things. Ecclesiastes 11.9, rejoice young man to command. Rejoice, young man, during your childhood. Let your heart be pleasant during the days of young manhood. Follow the impulses of your heart and the desires of your eyes. Yet know that God will bring you to judgment for all these things. Listen, God's not stingy. God wasn't stingy in the Garden of Eden when he told Adam and Eve they could eat from every tree of the garden. God was generous. He, he made good things to be enjoyed. The psalmist says, at the right hand of God are pleasures forevermore for those who belong to him. God is good. He's the giver of all good gifts. He is the source of enjoyment and he gives enjoyable things. And yet you will be assessed, creature, 
for how you assess those enjoyable things, how you use them, how you pursue them. Only Christians can have fun. You orient your life correctly with the God of the universe, the maker of all things, and he not only gives good things to enjoy, but the ability to enjoy them. Ecclesiastes 12, when all has been heard, fear God and keep his commandments, he brings everything to judgment, things hidden, good, and evil. That's the fundamental message of Ecclesiastes. If you keep that clear all the way through, then you can read every single verse in its place. Just know that when you come to something difficult, you scratch your head, you think, oh man, dead dogs better than a live lion, what, what is that? Push to the end. Solomon's driving you somewhere. You keep the end in view. Let's talk about the author of Ecclesiastes. Look at verse one of chapter one. The words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. Okay, who's the preacher? Someone who's proclaiming something. Who's the son of David? Okay, there, biblically, there are a lot of options for the son of David. You could have the immediate son. You could have one of many of David's sons. Uh, you could have a, a distant son of a son of a son of David. Jesus the Messiah would one day be called son of David. But then the last description sort of narrows this down. King. How many sons of David have been king? I should have come prepared with the answer to that. If you know it, Bible scholar, you can yell it out loud. I don't know the answer to that question. But how many have been king in Jerusalem? Not many. Not many. And then look over at verse 12 of chapter 1. I, the preacher, have been king over Israel in Jerusalem. How many could make that claim? Only one. Why is that? Because after Solomon's reign, the kingdom was divided. Israel referred to the northern ten tribes and Judah the southern two, and Jerusalem is in Judah in the south. There were no kings in Jerusalem over Israel after Solomon. Solomon's the only option. Now, I know you're sitting there, you're thinking, well, I knew that. I read Ecclesiastes chapter 1, I knew it was Solomon. Why do you make a big deal? Because nearly 90% of my library of commentaries on Ecclesiastes deny Solomonic authorship. That either says, we're out to lunch, or the world of biblical scholarship rejects the obvious at times. I think the latter is the case. And it's really tragic, and there are a number of reasons why people want to do that. It relates to the pride of scholastics. It relates to the tradition of scholarship, people that spend their whole life studying the Bible um, with the view that these are man's words and they must be studied from that perspective. It really is a problem, and, and you have to learn to read with discernment. So one of the reasons that Solomon in this book says Outside of the wise sayings of God, the devotion to many books is wearying. It's true. Uh, do you know that verse is actually, oh, should, I, should I give away the passcode to the library? I shouldn't do that. It's clever though, right? The church library's password is the reference to that verse. I won't mention the verse. There we go. Is that safe? We'll have to change it now. I'm so sorry. This made our librarians and administrator's life more difficult. Solomon is the author of Ecclesiastes. He calls himself here the preacher. It's the Hebrew word koaleth. And if you're reading about Ecclesiastes, you will read people call the author koaleth because they don't want to commit. I don't want to say it's Solomon. The world of scholarship will make fun of me for being a simpleton. Okay, so they'll just refer to the author as Coalette. If you see that, that's what's going on. It's just Solomon. Coalette means preacher. The, the verb just means to gather people together. So the preacher here, Solomon, is the assembler, the gatherer of people for a message. Uh, he's the professor. He's the teacher. He's assembled a group of people, and he has something to say, and the entirety of this message in one shot is his message. Solomon, David's son by Bathsheba, 
is the author, the preacher, the gatherer of the audience for this important message. The rise of Solomon is a tale of woe. Turn to 1 Kings chapter 2. This is David's charge to his son. As David's time to die drew near, he charged Solomon his son, saying, I am going the way of all the earth. Be strong, therefore, and show yourself a man. Keep the charge of Yahweh your God to walk in his ways, to keep his statutes, his commandments, his ordinances, and his testimonies according to what is written in the law of Moses, so that you may succeed in all that you do and wherever you turn. Look at verse 10. Then David slept with his fathers and was buried in the city of David. Look at verse 12. Solomon sat on the throne of David his father and his kingdom was firmly established. Look down at chapter 3, verse 1. Then Solomon formed a marriage alliance with Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And he took Pharaoh's daughter and brought her to the city of David. Here, Solomon makes a a political alliance with Egypt. And then look at verse 3. Solomon loved Yahweh, walking in the statutes of his father David, except, except he sacrificed and burned incense on the high places. What are the high places? What is this a reference to? This is a reference to idolatry. The high places were where the pagans worshipped all the false gods, the the demons and the idols that they thought would give them good stuff in life. And they thought the closer we get to the sky, the closer we get to heaven, the the closer we are to the gods and maybe they'll hear us and maybe they'll be appeased and, and they'll give us good crops and prosperity and long life and health. And Solomon caved in, he he compromised. We're going to find out why he did this. Look down at verse 5. In Gibeon, Yahweh appeared to Solomon in a dream at night, and God said, Ask whatever you wish for me to give you. And Solomon said, You have shown great loving kindness to your servant David, my father, according as he walked before you in truth and righteousness and uprightness of heart toward you. And you have reserved for him this great loving kindness, that you have given him a son to sit on his throne as it is this day. Now, O Yahweh, my God, you have made your servant king in place of my father, David. Yet I am but a little child. I do not know how to go out or come in. Your servant is in the midst of your people, which you have chosen, a great people who are too many to be numbered or counted. So give your servant an understanding heart to judge your people, to discern between good and evil. For who is able to judge this great people of yours? What's interesting here is Solomon saw his role as king as actually a servant of God and a servant of the people, not a position of power to get whatever he wants. And he sought the Lord's favor in getting help to that task. Notice what he wanted, to have wisdom, to have an understanding heart, to judge the people, to discern between good and evil. Really remarkable request. There's wisdom with a purpose. And when we get to Ecclesiastes 2, we discover what a tragedy it is, what Solomon decided to do with God's great gift. God's answer to Solomon's request is in verse 10. It was pleasing in the sight of the Lord that Solomon had asked this thing. God said to him, because you have asked for this and have not asked for yourself long life or riches, you have, uh, nor have you asked for the life of your enemies, but you have asked for yourself discernment to understand justice Behold, I have done according to your words. I had given you a wise and discerning heart. So that there has been no one like you before you, nor shall one like you arise after you. I have also given what you have not asked, riches and honor, so there will not be any among the kings like you all your days. If you will walk in my ways, keep my statutes and commandments, as your father David walked, then I will prolong your days." What a remarkable answer. Notice in 1 Kings 3.16, we get the first installment of the evidence 
of Solomon's wisdom. You remember the two women come, they're arguing over whose baby it is. Uh, one of the women's babies had died, the other remained. The woman whose baby died wanted the other woman's baby. Uh, how did Solomon decide between the two women? We'll cut the baby in half. And of course, the mother said, no, 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 she can keep it. And the not mother said, yeah, cut it in half. Nobody gets any. And Solomon awarded the baby to the true mother. A demonstration of wisdom. When you come to 1 Kings 4, you see the, the glory days of Solomon's reign. Look at verse 1. King Solomon was king over all Israel. Look down at verse 20. Judah and Israel were as numerous as the sand on the seashore, eating and drinking and rejoicing. Solomon ruled over all the kingdoms from the river to the land of the Philistines to the border of Egypt. They brought tribute and they served Solomon all the days of his life. Look at verse 22. Solomon's provision for one day was 30 cores of fine flour, 60 cores of meal, 10 fat oxen, 20 pasture-fed oxen, 100 sheep, besides deer, gazelles, roebucks, and fattened owl. That's his daily table. It's a party. A party every day for 30 to 40,000 people with the best the land had to offer says that Solomon had dominion over everything. Look at verse 30. We get a description of his wisdom. Solomon's wisdom surpassed the wisdom of all the sons of the east, all the wisdom of Egypt. He was wiser than all men, than Ethan the Ezraite. You've heard of him? Heman, Calcol, Darda, the sons of Mahol. And his fame was known in all the surrounding nations. He spoke 3,000 proverbs, wrote 1,005 songs. He spoke of trees, the cedars in Lebanon, to the hyssop that grows on the wall. He spoke of animals and birds and creeping things and fish. Men came from all peoples to hear the wisdom of Solomon, from all the kings of the earth who had heard of his wisdom. He just applied his mind, his bent for curiosity, to every field. It's like information entertained him. And he just enjoyed seeing the things that God had made. Really remarkable. Solomon went on to build the temple that his father David was not allowed to build. In 1 Kings 8, you get the dedication of this temple and a really remarkable prayer. It upholds the uniqueness of God, the grace of God, the faithfulness of Yahweh, God's transcendent bigness. Look at verse 27 of chapter 8. Will God indeed dwell on the earth? Heaven and the highest heavens can't contain God. How much less this house that I built. What a wonderful big God perspective Solomon has. Solomon goes on to reflect the, the heart of the Mosaic covenant. That the, the Mosaic law would set apart Israel as a nation as Yahweh's unique people so that the nations would look in on them and say, wow, they're different. Why are they different? Oh, they belong to Yahweh. I want to belong to Yahweh. And this comes out in Solomon's prayer. And he says, when, when people hear, then God, verse 39, then you hear in heaven your dwelling place and and forgive and act and render to each according to all his ways, whose heart you know. You alone know the hearts of all the sons of men, that they may fear you all the days that they live in the land that you've given them. And concerning the foreigner who is not of your people Israel, when he comes from a far country for your namesake, for they will hear of your great name and your mighty hand and your outstretched arm, when he comes and he prays toward this house, O oh Lord, here in heaven... Listen in your dwelling place and do according to all for which the foreigner calls to you in order that all the peoples of the earth may know your name to fear you as do your people Israel and that they may know that this house which I have built is called by your name. This is the Old Testament great commission being lived out by the king of Israel. Wholehearted devotion to the Lord, big God theology, praying before the people. And, and in this scene at the dedication of the temple, it's remarkable. The king, who is in charge of everybody, comes out, humbles himself in front of everybody before the Lord in prayer. It's an amazing scene. And it is only three chapters later that you come from 1 Kings 8 to 1 Kings 11. 
And look at verse 1 of 1 Kings 11. Now King Solomon loved many foreign women, along with the daughter of Pharaoh, Moabite, Ammonite, Edomite, Sidonian, and Hittite women, from the nations concerning which Yahweh said to the sons of Israel, you shall not associate with them. And I'm just going to tell you, marriage is a tight association. Solomon has made provision here for sin. God says, for they will surely turn your heart away after their gods. And notice the end of verse 2. Solomon held fast to these in love. What is the painful life lesson from Solomon here? Your life will be directed by the things you set your affections on. If you choose to turn your heart away from the Lord, if you choose to look under the sun rather than over the sun and try to find satisfaction in futile, fleeting, empty things, those things will tell you what to do. They will run your life. And they ruin Solomon's. He had 700 wives, princesses, 300 concubines, and his wives turned his heart away. For when Solomon was old, his wives turned his heart away after other gods, and his heart was not wholly devoted to Yahweh his God. Look at the list in verse 5. Solomon went after Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians, Milcom, the idol of the Ammonites. He did what was evil in the sight of Yahweh. He built a high place for Chemosh, the detestable idol of Moab, on the mountain which is east of Jerusalem, probably a reference to the Mount of Olives, Solomon built an, a high place for Chemosh and for Molech, the detestable idol of the sons of Ammon. You remember the worship of Molech. Molech was worshiped by dads and moms bringing their little ones to burn on the blazing arms of this metal idol. They killed their children to worship this idol. And Solomon built the altar for these idols in and around Jerusalem. What a compromise. What, what a tragedy. Verse 8 tells us, he did this for his foreign wives. And Yahweh was angry with Solomon because his heart was turned away from Yahweh. The result, verse 11 of chapter 11, is the kingdom would be torn away. Not in Solomon's lifetime for David's sake, but this is why the kingdom gets divided. Because of Solomon's own divided heart. So what is Ecclesiastes? Ecclesiastes, I believe, is Solomon's repentance. Because it deals with all the things of his life that he did evidently in adulthood. All the concerts and, and the pursuits and the architecture and the gardens and, and all the things he says he tried out in Ecclesiastes to try to find satisfaction. These are all things he did in his adulthood. In fact, turn to Ecclesiastes 2 and I will summarize this chapter. Solomon said... Come now, I will test you with pleasure, so enjoy yourself. And behold, it too was hevel, futility, emptiness, vanity. In verse 2, he said, I said, laughter, it's madness. And a pleasure, what does it accomplish? He experimented with fun. In verse 3, with getting high, stimulating his body with wine while his mind was guiding him wisely. What's interesting about Solomon's experiment here is he dives into the things that would supposedly bring satisfaction. He does so with his eyes wide open. There are some who get stoned into oblivion and have no idea what's going on. Solomon, as the scientist, is going, I want to see what it's like to get drunk and to experience it and to take notes and to figure it out and find what pleasure there is in it. And he did the same thing with stuff in verse 4. I enlarged my works, houses, vineyards, gardens, parks, ponds of water, flocks and herds and slaves, silver and gold and the treasures of kings. And he tried the experiment with sex in verse 8. 
In fact, in verse 10, he says, All that my eyes desired, I did not refuse them. I did not withhold my heart from any pleasure. My heart was pleased because of all of my labor, and this was my reward for my labor. Then I considered all my activities which my hands had done and the labor which I had exerted, and behold, all was vanity, striving after the wind and nothing. One of the reasons providentially we have Solomon's life and his exposure and his wealth and his experiences and the record of his repentance is so that you and I can look at his life and read his sermon and not do what he did. And listen, you will never have the resources Solomon had. You cannot out Solomon Solomon in terms of monetary access to get whatever you want, whenever you want it, with all the world bringing you all of its goods in an instant. We get closer than most in history. But Solomon is the pinnacle. I can have whatever I want, when I want it. And he found it all to be nothing, a waste. What a tragedy that the wisdom that God had given him, Solomon turned in on himself. It was supposed to be used to judge the people and to discern right and wrong. He instead said, I'm going to use all these great smarts to figure out pleasure, fun, drunkenness, materialism, immorality. And this great experiment was a bust, which is why Solomon writes the sermon In his repentance, he pens for us the answer to the riddle of life from the perspective of one who exhausted every so-called pathway to happiness. And he leaves all of us with the perspective he should have started with, fear of the Lord. What is the method for reading this book? You need to read it as wisdom literature. Some of Uh, What happens in Proverbs or in Ecclesiastes are a series of Proverbs, like the book of Proverbs, that that give pithy statements for wise living, and it takes wisdom to apply them. Some of Solomon's messages are, how do we wrestle with inequities of life? Why, Why does the oppressor win, and why do the oppressed suffer? Why do bad things happen to the people who do fear the Lord? And and why do great things seem to happen to people who don't care about the Lord? Solomon addresses all of these things. And sometimes it's not quite the answers we would look for. Oh, I need to know exactly what God is doing here. Actually, Solomon kind of gives us the big picture. In chapter 7, he says, God has bent the cosmos the universe. Who can straighten it? This is a reflection of Genesis and Genesis 3 and the curse that God placed on everything because of sin. And by the way, that is a gift. That is a grace gift from God that he bent the universe. You see, in the Garden of Eden, when Adam and Eve worked and cultivated the garden, it yielded fruit. After the fall, God said, okay, you're not going to die right away. God was gracious. He said, you will eat, but you're going to eke bread out the ground by the sweat of your face. The ground's going to bear thorns and thistles. It's going to be hard work. In the Garden of Eden, you throw stuff in the ground, it grows, you eat it. It's great. But since the fall of man, the universe is bent It is broken. It is frustrated. The Apostle Paul picks up on this idea in Romans 8 that that all creation is frustrated, craning its neck around the corner, waiting to see, longing for the day when men are redeemed, when the sons of God are glorified and they look like Christ. Then creation will be set free from its subjection to, and Paul's word is, futility. He's using the same word the Greek translation used to describe futility in Ecclesiastes. In other words, the world is broken on purpose. And you and I spin our wheels trying to unbend the universe. No, 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 it's bent on purpose. Why? So that you don't find it home here. Your ultimate things, your satisfaction, your joy, your contentment, your peace, your happiness are not to be found here under the sun. 
the other key phrase in the book of Ecclesiastes. What's the contrast? Look over the sun. Get beyond this world. Get rightly related to your maker. And the bottom line is eschatological. When the end comes, God will judge everything, all the secrets of the heart, and he will reward according to those who are rightly related to him. Listen, there is an unbroken world in the next life for those who fear the Lord. But God won't let you have satisfaction and joy and ultimate things here without him. It's kind of like the cherubim with the flaming sword right outside the Garden of Eden. You remember that? Adam and Eve get kicked out, can't go back in. What was in there? The tree of life. Live forever. Direct access to God in your sinful state. Not going to happen. So the cherubim guard the way. The brokenness of the universe post-fall guards the way of us being fat, dumb, and happy without the Lord. It's actually a gift. What do we learn from Ecclesiastes? Yeah, all of life is this woven tapestry that you and I don't understand from the bottom side, and there's hard things, and that ought to make us restless, homesick for our permanent residence, seeking the Lord, seeking satisfaction in Him alone. There's something greater than Solomon, of course, in our Bibles. It is the Lord Jesus Christ. Luke 11:31 says, "The queen of the south will rise up with the men of this generation at the judgment and condemn them, because she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon, and behold, something greater than Solomon is here." Who is Jesus referring to in the greater than Solomon? He's referring to himself. Solomon would have pointed us to Christ had he our vantage point. Again and again in the book of Ecclesiastes, he vexes us with the futility of the pursuit of life under the sun and points us to the fear of the Lord. This side of the incarnation and the cross and the resurrection, that points us to the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen, if you know him, if you've got forgiveness of sin and you've submitted your life to his lordship, you get all the benefits of all that God gives in his generosity to those who believe. If you refuse Christ, you can never live wisely. You will always spin your wheels on the futility of life under the sun, seeking to squeeze out of life that which cannot be squozen. Satisfaction, happiness, joy, fulfillment. It can only be found in God. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this book, this repentance sermon message from a king given so many gifts given so much wisdom and in many ways squandering them may we not squander this lesson may we learn from ecclesiastes i pray that it would course through our veins even shape the way we live and think and move all the days that you give us under the sun we pray to live in the fear of you anticipating final judgment and the rewarder of those who fear you And we ask it in Jesus' name, amen.